Our first reading this morning is a New Testament lesson from Acts chapter 1. And here in the Easter season, we do replace the Old Testament lesson with readings from Acts. And today, this reading serves as the basis for today's sermon text. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning, as Pastor Elliot announced, is the reading from Acts chapter 1, the account of Jesus' ascension. We have come to the end of the Easter season. For three Sundays, we witnessed the resurrection appearances of Jesus, where our text today says he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Then for three more Sundays, we revisited Jesus' teachings from our post-resurrection perspective that he is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep, that he is the vine and we are the, the branches, and that only by abiding in his love will our lives bear fruit, fruit that will last. But this is an ending that marks the beginning of the final thrilling stage in God's plan to rescue and to restore his whole creation. Although the ascension of Jesus is an often forgotten and overlooked moment, unlike Christmas, unlike Easter, you can't go to Target and buy a happy Ascension Day card. So today we have to learn that it is in fact Jesus' ascension that unleashes the power that changes the world starting with our little corner of it. The ascension of Jesus opens the way for the kingdom of God, which is the world put right, to spread wherever two or three are gathered together in his name. The ascension of Jesus unleashes the power of our witness and our worship. The first thing we need to do is take a big step back, try to wrap our minds around the big picture that the Bible paints of us, paints for us of heaven and earth. Now most of us, I suspect, grew up, at least I did, thinking that heaven was a place far, far away that, that we would go to someday if we only believe in Jesus. And earth, well, well, earth is this broken mess that we live in now, doing the best we can to survive until we die or Jesus comes again and we finally get to escape. But the biblical picture 
is that heaven and earth were created by God as an overlapping, interlocking, fully joined it together place where God would dwell continuously with us, where we would participate with him in filling and de developing the world that he created for us. Human beings uh, were intended, were meant to be fruitful, to multiply, to investigate, to invent everything under the sun. Of course, that all went haywire. And it was then necessary for God not to go away but for God to separate the two dimensions of his creation. Because sinful human beings can now no longer dwell in the face-to-face -face presence of God and live to tell about it. This is the big picture. That heaven where God dwells is all around us. Earth is enveloped and surrounded by heaven. Now there are little snippets in the story of heaven and earth in the Bible where God draws back the curtain. The invisible barrier between heaven and earth is lowered to allow little glimpses of the heavenly part of his created reality. Think, think Elisha. And the chariots of fire at Dothan in 2 Kings chapter 6. Surrounded by an enemy army, Elisha's servant is, is, is terrified. And Elisha prays, O Lord, open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Or think of Stephen in, in Acts chapter 7, boldly proclaiming the good news about Jesus when the crowds became enraged and began to stone him to death. But we read Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and at Jesus at the right hand of God. Years ago, Pastor Roberts preached a sermon and, and told about an old Celtic Christian tradition that there are actually thin places in this domain, in this space that we occupy where heaven and earth virtually touch. And one of those we celebrate today. In the Lord's Supper, with all of the angels and the archangels and the company of heaven. Heaven and earth touch this morning as you receive the body and the blood of Jesus in, with, and under the bread and the wine. This is the big picture of heaven and earth overlapping, interlocking, fully joined it together, and it will blow your mind, people, if you will simply let it sink in. Because it means that by his ascension, by re-entering the realm of heaven that envelops this world, Jesus went from being present in one geographical place at one moment in the time to being present everywhere all the time. Look, that's why Jesus had to tell Mary Magdalene when she was the first one to see him after the resurrection and she grabbed onto him and hold, held, him so, held him so tightly. I picture Jesus not being able to breathe. And Jesus said to her, Mary, don't hold on to me. I'm ascending to my Father. Now, it wasn't that he didn't want her to touch them. In the very next scene, he tells Thomas to reach out your hand and touch me. A ghost that doesn't have flesh and bones. No, here's what he was saying to Mary. Mary, you only know one way to relate to me. And you're afraid to let go of me. If you stick to this way of thinking, all you will have of me are the memories. But if you let go, 
If you let go of that limited understanding of heaven and earth, if I ascend, you'll never lose me again. There will never, ever, ever be a time when I'm not with you. They can, they can chain you up, lock you in the deepest dungeon, put bars on the doors, but I will be closer to you than ever. Look, we use the word ascend in a couple of different ways. One, of course, is the picture of going up. We're used to that here in Central Florida. The rocket takes off from Cape Canaveral. It ascends into the sky until it disappears sometimes behind a bank of clouds. But this word is also used to describe what happens when a king comes to power. He what? He ascends, he ascends to the throne. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean he's just climbing some set of stairs and sitting down in a big chair somewhere. It is about assuming a new role. It's about taking on the mantle of power so that he can now rule and reign over his kingdom. Look, humanity in the beginning rebelled against God's rule and his reign over his creation. In effect, the human race declared its independence from God. And collectively, we still imagine that if we only had the right leadership, if we only had enough education and more money, that we could make the world right by ourselves. But it hasn't worked. It's not going to work. So Jesus... True God, one with the Father and the Spirit, put on our human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. He entered into this broken, dying, sin-sick part of the creation called earth, and he lived the perfect life of trust and obedience that humanity was created to live. And then... Jesus succored Satan and the, the ruling powers of Rome and the Jewish religious leaders into thinking that if they killed him, they could stay in power. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he effectively destroyed the ultimate weapon that Satan and whatever powers that be wield to terrorize us, to keep us in submission. Jesus destroyed the power of sin and of death forever. Now we say it every time we confess our faith in the creeds. He ascended into heaven and he sits down at the right hand of God. Jesus has ascended the throne means that Jesus is now in charge. That the kingdom of God has come. That the world put right, right now by our faith in him until he comes again to make it permanent everywhere and forever. To once and for all bring down the invisible barrier separating heaven and earth. And then all creation will be restored. Heaven and earth rejoined. Now that all sounds too good to be true. Especially when you look around and you listen to the news and you face the day-to-day -day circumstances of your own life. But here's the thing, while the work of rescue and restoration is complete, Jesus said it himself on the cross, it is finished. The work of announcing his rule and his reign, the work of extending his kingdom, the world put right to the ends of the earth right now by faith in him is an ongoing work in progress. The ascension of Jesus unleashes the power of our witness 
and our worship to proclaim the kingdom has come on earth as it is in heaven by showing and telling the world about Jesus. To extend his domain, to extend the territory of his kingdom by the way that we live, the things that that we do in all of the everyday ordinary activities of our life. And for that, we will need the Holy Spirit's continuous and ongoing help. Jesus didn't leave us to figure it out by by ourselves. He didn't ascend to the throne of the kingdom of God and say, good luck. Jerusalem was the headquarters of God's real presence in the world. Did you know that there are some ancient maps that drew Jerusalem as the center of the world? Jesus told his first followers to go and wait there for a powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit then comes and empowers God's people to witness and worship in such a way that we become a bright light shining in the darkness of this world, drawing all people to trust and to believe in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is not floating around willy-nilly, randomly bopping people on the head every once in a while. The Holy Spirit comes into our lives when we hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the Word, the Bible, in all of its form. The Holy Spirit rushes in every time you see, taste, touch, hear, or smell water, and you remember your baptism where you were united with Jesus in His death and resurrection. The Holy Spirit feeds you with the bread of life, Jesus' own body and blood that awaits you at the altar this morning. The Holy Spirit nurtures and grows your faith when you talk about your Jesus adventure with fellow followers and you talk with God in your prayers. Look, what did Jesus say last week? Whatever you ask the Father... And I would add, with respect to this work of expanding the kingdom of God, which is the world put right, whatever you ask in Jesus' name for the purpose of extending his kingdom, he will grant it. Ask for wisdom. Ask for courage. Ask for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So that your witness and your worship will be so captivating that others will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In other words, it will inspire people to say, I want what you have. The peace that passes all understanding. The hope that never disappoints. But Jesus' disciples asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Which reveals that they are still thinking very parochially, very small, very confined, very limited geographic restoration When Jesus has something much, much bigger in mind. The disciples ask Jesus, will you? And Jesus says, no, 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 that's the wrong question. The right question is, will you? Each of you individually and all of us collectively Will you surrender your whole life to Jesus and bring your thoughts, your words, your actions, your attitudes under his rule and his reign? Because that is true worship that Jesus' ascension unleashes into your life. Will you treat your spouse in such a way that others marvel at your kindness 
and your patience? Will you treat other students at school with respect and compassion? Will you participate in this political season in our country with dignity and integrity, resisting the simplistic urge to villainize and demonize people who disagree with you? Will you do your work honestly and diligently, even if that means you might not get the big promotion or land the big deal? Will you radically share your resources, your labor, your influence, your finances, your expertise to help make this little corner of the world right? Will you come to church and not just go through the religious motions, but fully immerse yourself in, in the music and in the words and in the fellowship? Jesus' ascension unleashes the power for that kind of life, a life of worship and witness. The disciples asked Jesus, will you? Jesus says, no, no, no. The question is, will you? Whenever and wherever the opportunity presents itself, tell people about me. Tell them about the kingdom of God, the world put right, right now by faith. Will you teach your children? Will you get to know your coworkers and your neighbors well enough to give them the good news that the kingdom is coming on earth as it is in heaven? Would you ever consider whether God might be calling you or one of your children into full-time ministry of preaching and to teaching? The disciples asked Jesus, will you? Jesus said, no, no, no. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Amen. Now the peace that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in this true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Here's your weekly awakening question. What specific opportunities for witnessing is God empowering in your life? I'd really love for you to talk about two, maybe three things this week where you can see the specific opportunity for witnessing, whether it's in word or in deed, of God empowering in your life.